You are watching programming from the East West Center in Washington, D.C. It gives me great pleasure today to have with us uh, numerous distinguished colleagues from Japan, as well as our colleague from the Office of the Secretary of Defense of the United States um, and the director of the Japan uh, uh, element of that, uh, uh, of the Department of Defense to speak on the issue of today's seminar, reducing the burden of military bases on Okinawa, implications of the new security environment. This could not be more timely as this particular webinar focuses on a new report that was released in March by the Bankoku Shinryo Council appointed by the prefectural governor, uh, Mr. Tamaki, whose video we will in fact uh, have prior to the presentations. That report has been provisionally translated in English and our colleagues from Japan are, who served on that council, which refers to Bridging Nations Council, will be presenting key findings of that report. And then we have the uh, opportunity to hear from Mr. Vosti from the Department of Defense on some comments that he wishes to make regarding the issues raised and, and the report. So that is the format for today's program. As, I, as you all know who have joined us, this is an important element and a long running issue in the US-Japan relationship. And the East-West Center has on many occasions previously hosted visitors, officials, scholars, academics uh, in, in our mission to improve understanding and improve relations between the United States and Asia to have this exchange of views. And so we're delighted to have this again. I want to thank Professor Mike Mochizuki uh, of George Washington University uh, for raising the prospect of this webinar with us. Of course, to all our participants from Japan staying up late in the evening to join us. And Sarah, thank you for the uh, complicated logistics and technical feats that you have achieved to have us all here. With that, let me turn over to Sarah. Um, I believe you are going to now load up the video from Governor Tanaki, yes? Yes, I will be doing that in one second. はい、沖縄県戦後私は日米安全保障体制を含む日米同盟関係がこれまで我が国及び東アジアにおける平和と安定の維持に寄与してきたものと理解しています。また近年は中国の軍事的な対等などにより日本や東アジアなどを取り巻く安全保障環境の厳
私たちの沖縄県に在日米軍専用施設面積の7割の米軍基地が集中している現状は異常であり、到底容認できるものではありません。沖縄県ではこの広大な基地の存在により、航空機騒音、事件、事故、PFAS などの環境汚染など、過重な基地負担が生じています。日米安全保障体制を安定的に維持するため、基地負担は沖縄のみならず、日本全国で担うべきだと私たちは考えており、機会あるごとに日米両政府に訴えているところです。特に世界一危険とも言われている普天間飛行場の代替施設の建設計画については、25年前の古い計画であり、現在の安全保障環境の変化を踏まえたものとなっていないということに加え、小永前知事と私がこの計画への反対を公約に掲げて選挙に当選し、同計画の賛否に限定した県民投票では、投票総数の 71.7% の圧倒的多数の県民がこれに反対する意思を明確に示しています。このようなことからも、普天間飛行場の代替施設は、辺野古移設を前提に進めるのではなく、普天間飛行場の一日も早い危険性の除去と早期閉鎖、返還に向かった代替案、プラン B を検討し、実行すべきであります。現在の計画により、埋め立てが行われている海域は、ジュゴンをはじめとする絶滅危惧種262種を含む5300種以上の生物が確認されており、生物の多様性が極めて高い、世界的にも重要な海域です。さらにこの海域には軟弱地盤や活断層の問題などが存在するため、代替施設は技術的にも財政的にも完成が困難であり、この計画の目的である普天間飛行場の早期の返還にはつながらないことが明らかです。また、仮にこの代替施設を十数年かけて完成させたとしても、不動沈下の発生が予測され、滑走路の運用に支障が生じる可能性が高い上に、ひとたび、大きな地震が起きた場合には、米軍人の生命や米軍の財産に多大な影響を及ぼすことになると思います。それは、ひいては、アメリカの国益を損なうことにもつながります。沖縄県では、沖縄の過重な基地負担の状況や、近年の安全保障環境の変化などを踏まえ、在沖米軍基地の整理縮小に向けた議論を行うことを目的として、今回のウェビナーのテーマとなる提言書を取りまとめた米軍基地問題に関するバンコク診療会議を設置いたしました。この会議では、外交・安全保障の専門家による2年間の議論を経て、2度にわたり非常に示唆に富む様々な提言をまとめていただきました。沖縄県は第二次世界大戦後、27年にわたり、アメリカ合衆国の姿勢喧嘩に置かれており、1972年5月15日に姿勢喧が日本に復帰をいたしました。2022年には、日本復帰から50年という大きな節目を迎えます。沖縄県としては、この復帰から50年という機会を捉え、万国診療会議の提言を活用して、日米両政府に対し、在沖米軍基地の一層の整理縮小、負担軽減に向けた取り組みを要請したいと考えております。最後になりますが、今回のウェビナーのご参加者の皆様におかれましては、沖縄に思いを寄せていただき、活発なご議論を通して、在沖米軍基地の整理縮小に向けて、私たちに力を貸してくださるよう、よろしくお願いいたします。改めまして、リマイエ首長とパネリストの皆様、ご参加の皆様に感謝を申し上げ、ご挨拶とさせていただきます。一平二平デイビル、ありがとうございました。Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed, Governor Tamaki, for that statement and for joining us by video from Okinawa. Uh, prior to the start of the presentations. I now have the honor to、uh, welcome the panel panelists, and you see on your program 
the order in which they will speak because of their extremely distinguished experience, expertise, and work on issues surrounding the US-Japan relationship and the Okinawa issue specifically, I won't go into full details, but they are available uh, in your invitation and you will see bios provided. With that, to maximize our time for discussion and to hear from our distinguished colleagues, may I invite the chair of the Bridging Nations Council or Banco Kushinryo Council on US military base issues, Mr. Kyoji Yanagisawa. Please, sir. はい、お願いします。よろしくお願いします。え、我々をご招待いただいたことにまず感謝申し上げたいと思います。えっと、え、戦略的な競争関係、そしてそれが沖縄に与える影響ということを論じています。え、3番目には、え、米軍の新しい作戦構想をとそれが沖縄に及ぼす影響を論じています。え、4番目には、え、ま、あの、日本の外交姿
隣接の小学校や保育園の校内にヘリコプターの部品が落下するような事故も発生しているわけです。でこれらはあの子どもがいる時間帯に起きている事故で、幸い、けが人はなかったんですけれども、被害がなかったことがむしろ奇跡的とも言えるう事故であったと思っていますね。仮に,仮に民間人が負傷、えー、あるいはあ、えー、犠牲になるような事故があったとすれば、これはもうその普天間だけではなくて、沖縄基地全体の存続が危ぶ,、ま、危ぶまれるような、そういう大きな問題であるということを考えておかなければいけないと思います。でただあの、本当に今の日本政府、あるいはアメリカ政府の姿勢を見てますと、どうもそこまでの危機感が共有されていないと。思えるのはまさに本当に信じがたい思いで、えー、おります。えー、そしてあの、えー、辺野古について言いますと、まあ、日本政府は、えー、唯一の普天間の危険性を除去するための唯一の解決策であるとこう言ってるんですが、しかし私はむしろその最もありえない不可能な選択肢であるというふうに言わざるを得ないと思っています。でその問題技術的な問題はやはりあの大浦湾建設予定地の大浦湾にある海底の軟弱地盤の問題です。でこの軟弱地盤に対応するために日本政府の見積もりでは12年の歳月と9300億円の経費が必要になると言っています。で、この4月にあのキャンプシュワーブ、まあ、辺野古にあるキャンプシュワーブの南側の埋め立てを完了したということになっていますけれども、えーまあ、それでもその面積としては 25%、そして、必要な埋め立てのための土砂の投入量としては、えー、とこれは、えー、と100000うんと20あ、えー、ここにありますように、えー、206.2 ト、ミリオンの立方メーターが必要なところ、その 6% しか完了してない。とということでありますす工事は遅れておりますでそしてあの技術的な問題をもう一度繰り返しますと実はそのキャンプシュワーブの今南側は埋め立てを完了したと言ってるんですが北側にある大浦湾これはあの非常に複雑な海底地形とそしてその一番深いところで水面下90メートルに及ぶ軟弱地盤が存在しているわけですけれども今まで日本で行われたこの種の地盤改良工事の実績としては水面下70メートルまでしかやったことがないんですねそしてそういうことをそういう工事を行うための専用の船は船はあるんですけれども、70メートルにしか対応できない、ですから90メートルまでの軟弱地盤に対して、えー、実施可能な工事は70メートルまでというふうに考えられます。で、あの政治的な課題としては、えー、先ほど知事も言ってました、まあ、ちょっと数字が違いますけれども、えー、2019年の県民投票では、投票者の 70% 以上が辺野古の埋め立てに反対をしています。それからもう一つ新たな問題として、えー、大浦湾の埋め立てに極めて膨大な量の土砂が必要になってくるわけですけれども、これを沖縄県内からこの土を取ってくるということにした場合、まあ、そういう。計画になっておりますけれども
沖縄の特に沖縄本島の南部地域というのは第二次大戦末期の沖縄戦の激戦地であったわけでここにはまだ、えー、戦争で亡くなった方々の遺骨がまだ残されていると言われておりましてこういうところの土を使うことになれば沖縄県民の反発はなおさら深刻なものになるだろうと思っています。まあ、こういうようよな状況ですから私どもとしては、辺野古を埋め立てるという選択肢は、技術的にも政治的にも財政的にも最もありえない選択肢というべきだろうと思っています。で、あのアメリカ政府、あるいはアメリカ側は、もう絶えずこの問題は日本政府の問題だと、日本政府と沖縄県の間の問題であるという立場であったと思います。まあ、しかしかながら4月の先のバイデン大統領と菅首相による共同声明が出されましたけれども、そこでは日米首脳の共同声明として、辺野古が唯一の選択肢であるということが明言されているわけですね。そうすると、アメリカ政府もこのことに対する当事者として、もう自ら日本政府に任せるのではなくて、自らその実現可能性をしっかりと検証をしていく必要があるのではないかというふうに私は考えています。それからそのもう一つ、今度はその普天間の問題について言いますと、普天間,の普天間飛行場の離発着の回数ですね。これはあの軽減されるどころか、むしろあの近年増大しているという傾向があるわけです。えーまあ、2017年に1万3581ソーティーというか、581回の離発着があった、18年には、えー、それが1万6332、えー、19年には1万6848、さらにあの20年はまだ数字が閉まってませんけれど、えー、増加する傾向にある。これは主にえー、普天間に配,配属されているヘリコプターの機数が増えていることと、もう一つは、えーえー、カデナなどの他の基地に所在する外来の飛行機の使用が、頻度が増えているということであります。まあ、こういう、こうしたことで、その、えー、普天間の危険性除去等、逆の動きがあるわけですから、まあ、このこうした米軍の運用については、日米両政府の責任で早急に対応することが必要であるというふうに私は思っております。私の方からは以上です。どうもありがとうございました。Well, thank you very much indeed,、uh, Yanagi Sawa san,、uh, for the initial presentation. And we will move directly now to Dr. Mike Mochizuki, who is the Japan US Relations Chair in Memory of Gaston Seeger at the Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University. Welcome, Mike, and thank you so much for this、uh, webinar and for your participation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Satu.、Uh, I want to thank you、uh, and the East West Center、uh, for agreeing to、uh, host this uh, program. Uh, my role in the drafting of the Bangkoku Shinryo Kaigi report has been to、uh, focus on Chapter 2,、uh, which deals、uh, with the intensification of the US China strategic、uh, competition and the implications for Okinawa.、Uh, and in this chapter, I argued that this. Uh, competition between the United States and China、uh, is likely to、uh, intensify for five uh, uh, reasons. Uh, one uh, is the、uh, profound shift in the balance of power and the psychological effect that this has on both the United States and China.、Uh, secondly, uh, uh, because of the、uh, military competition、uh, that is now emerging between. Uh, these two countries in the Asia Pacific region and the Indo Pacific region.、Uh, thirdly, 
You know, although traditionally economic interdependence was seen as a factor that could mitigate uh, conflicts uh, between countries, uh, we now see that this economic interdependence may be reinforcing uh, rather than mitigating this rivalry. Uh, fourthly, uh, there is now, I think, an increasingly uh, uh, ideological overlay uh, to this competition. And finally, the United States and China uh, appear to be uh, competing intensely about uh, the regional order uh, and the international uh, order. And so uh, our conclusion is uh, that uh, not only will the US-China competition become uh, more intense, uh, but it is likely to be much more uh, complex uh, than the US-Soviet Cold War. And therefore there is a greater danger of miscalculation and conflict. So what then are the implications for Okinawa? Well, I believe that it will make much more challenging and complicated the task of reducing uh, the burden of US uh, military presence on Okinawa. And I say this uh, uh, because I think there are two somewhat contradictory uh, tendencies uh, that emerge uh, out of this intensifying uh, strategic uh, competition. Uh, one is given the rise of Chinese military capabilities, uh, US military assets on Japan are, uh, and, and especially in Okinawa, are becoming uh, more vulnerable. And therefore, there will be strong incentives on the part of the United States uh, to disperse this military presence, to move away from the current structure of a few highly concentrated uh, military bases uh, in Okinawa and in Japan, to disperse this military presence uh, into other parts of Japan and throughout the region. Uh, but at the same time, uh, precisely because of this vulnerability and China's anti-access and aerial deni area denial capabilities, there will also be strong incentives on the United States uh, to make much more robust and resilient uh, the existing US military presence in Okinawa, as well as the rest of uh, Japan. Uh, the other implication of the intensification of US-China rivalry uh, is that Okinawa has become uh, a much more the front line of this rivalry and, the, and a possible uh, military conflict uh, between these two countries. Uh, therefore, more than ever uh, before, Okinawa has a much greater stake in promoting peace and stability and avoiding uh, war. Now, uh, the rest of this chapter uh, turns to the implications of the Biden uh, administration uh, for US-Japan relations and Okinawa in particular. Now, and I argue uh, that there's certainly a, a big difference between uh, President Biden and President Trump uh, President Biden uh, will be uh, much less uh, erratic and more steady in terms of the, his pursuit of foreign policy. Uh, President Biden has moved away uh, from the hostile America first uh, rhetoric. Uh, but when you look at the approach uh, to China, I think that there is uh, a basic continuity between Trump and Biden uh, regarding a tough approach to China. Uh, but there is uh, a key difference between the Trump administration and the Biden administration. And that difference is that the Biden administration, much more than its predecessors, will put a greater emphasis on allies and partners. So what then are the implications of this emphasis on allies and partners for Japan and Okinawa? I think there are, are three implications. Uh, first of all, uh, the United States uh, will give stronger and more consistent reassurance regarding its security commitment uh, to Japan and the Asia Pacific uh, region. But at the same time, uh, secondly, uh, the United States will, will have higher expectations of Japan and other allies and partners to contribute more uh, to common defense objectives. But in addition to this reassurance and higher expectations of greater contributions, the United States uh, uh, should also give Japan greater voicing opportunities. 
Uh, because of the change in the balance of power, uh, Japan is even more essential uh, to U.S. strategy. So given this change, uh, I argue that Japan and Okinawa should not hesitate to voice its concerns to the United States about the intensification of U.S.-China strategic rivalry uh, and to suggest ways to reduce the U.S. military presence uh, and burden on Okinawa. Uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mike, uh, Professor Mochizuki. That was a, a very useful statement on the U.S.-China overlay and how it uh, impacts this issue. So we will now turn to Dr. Fumiaki Nozoe, Associate Professor at the Okinawa International University and who served as the Vice Chair of the Bankuku Shinryo Council. Thank you very much for joining us, Professor, and please proceed with your presentation. Uh, thank you for introduction, uh, Dr. Satu. Uh, I'm Fumiaki Nozoe. Uh, it's my great pleasure to join this webinar. My presentation is about chapter three of this report. In this chapter, we argue that reduction of a burden of US military bases on Okinawa should be promoted in the context of the new US military strategy. Given the US-China strategic competition, Okinawa in the first island chain is in the strategically important location. However, many people in Okinawa have been dissatisfied with the huge US military presence for a long time. Therefore, bases in Okinawa are politically vulnerable. In addition to that, as China enhances her military capability, such as anti-access and area denial capability, the US military predominance in Western Pacific is eroded and Chinese ballistic and cruise missiles places US military bases in Okinawa at risk. Against this backdrop, the US military is developing the new operational concept. The US Air Force is developing the agile combat employment under this concept, the US Air Force in Kadena conducts exercises for distributed operations. The US Marine Corps is also developing its own new operational concept called Expeditionary Advanced Base Operations, EBOR. During this EBOR, small units of Marine Corps disperse on key maritime trains and build temporary missile and refueling stations in order to conduct sea denial and sea control. In recent article, Commandant David Barber stressed that given the vulnerability of large fixed bases to long range precision strike, the US MC force must be able to conduct operations from a strictly expeditionary and highly mobile posture and its constant distributed presence will introduce significant uncertainty into an adversary's decision making. Because the Marine Corps is the largest US military force in Okinawa, these reorganization and new operational concept will have significant implications on Okinawa. Of course, such a new operational concept does not necessarily lead to reduction of the US bases on Okinawa. A new Marine Corps force design three Marine Expeditionary Force headquartered at Okinawa is to be the focal point. One of the new Marine Littoral Regiments is to be set up at Okinawa. And recent intensive trainings for Ibo have had a severe impact on the local community. On the other hand, it is true that large fixed and concentrated bases in Okinawa are militarily vulnerable. In recent article, Kurt Campbell, the Indo-Pacific coordinator in the Biden administration stated, Washington needs to work with other states to disperse US forces across Southeast Asia and the Indian Ocean in order to reduce American reliance on small number of vulnerable facilities in East Asia. 
In addition to that, chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, Mark Miller, also questioned the large scale permanent stationing of the US forces and suggested the need for rotational deployment. In this context, reduction of the burden of military bases on Okinawa should be sought by dispersing the US military force from Okinawa to main islands in Japan and other location across the Indo-Pacific region. Finally, even if all the land of the bases south of Kadena is returned as agreed in 2006, about 69% of the land area ex exclusively used by the US forces in Japan would still be concentrated on Okinawa. This plan is not enough for reducing of military bases in Okinawa. Therefore, the Japanese and US governments and the Okinawa prefectural government need to have cross dialogue over the future of the US bases in Okinawa. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Nozoi, uh, for that presentation and, and very good also to see your PowerPoints. I should mention at this juncture that um, the participants in today's program uh, who have PowerPoints and even uh, others who did not use a PowerPoint will be preparing them and we will post them along with the recording of today's program so that our participants may refer to them um, as they uh, consider uh, what they heard and saw today. We now turn with great pleasure to Professor Yoshihide Soya, Professor Emeritus at Keio University it's very good to see you again, uh, Soya Sensei, and delighted to have you with us. Please proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Satu, for, for your introduction. And uh, as, as you rightly said, I'm now Professor Emeritus, which means I retired from, from KO and uh, having a relaxed uh, life supported by pension. Not bad. Well, uh, uh, this chapter basically talks about the role of diplomacy. Uh, therefore, uh, the perspective is is a bit longer, longer than some, some you know some, some other people's uh, you know uh, attention, and, uh, and 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 I in my I mean in this chapter uh, uh, there are some some critical arguments about the current posture of the Japanese government. Uh, but uh, that, that critical perspective uh, rests upon two or three basic assumptions uh, that I have, uh, which is not discussed in this chapter, but allow me to just go over quickly. Uh, one is uh, how, how you look at the sort of aggressive uh, posture of China. And uh, I think to make complex things simple, I think at, at the heart of this lies the Chinese sense of sort of, uh, you know, uh, having, uh, having sort of, you know, uh, gone through the hundred years of humiliation, national humiliation, and now time has finally come for China to come back to the original place where it used to be. That is, of course, at the center of Asian order. And uh, so, so somewhat reminiscent of uh, Sinocentricism. And maybe, maybe one of the end goals of this is uh, kind of a recovery of Taiwan. And I think uh, their recent sort of aggressive postures has, ha has a lot to do with this psychological aspect of, of the Chinese. And uh, when it comes to this point, I think Chinese are almost unanimous, including you know, enlightened Chinese living abroad, educated abroad, and so forth. So this raises a question, a fundamental question. I mean, to what extent and how long uh, deterrence would work? If, if this is sort of the Chinese dream is the driving force, I think at the end point, uh, I think uh, deterrence is not going to be effective. And of course, that's the Chinese goal, to win the battle without actually fighting. And uh, and so, the, so that's one assumption uh, of mine. And the second, uh, Japanese government in defending, you know, Henoko plan and every, almost everything about uh, military presence in Okinawa, uh, they often talk about defense of Senkaku. 
And, uh, but if, if what I said about, you know, China's long-term dream is correct, then I think Senkak contingencies should be regarded as part of bigger Taiwan contingency. Uh, in other words, uh, Chinese planning could and maybe should be to deal with Senkak as part of bigger Taiwan contingency. So just preoccupation with Senkaku, I, I, I don't think will lead to any credible so-called strategic, you know, approach, uh, you know, coming from Japan. And, uh, and the third assumption is if military clash actually happens, this is a catastrophe. And of course, in many ways it is, but economic catastrophe, uh, you know, uh, among others, supply chains will be cut off and uh, American dependence on China economically is greater than Chinese dependence on the United States. And this is sort of, you know, inflation and so forth, all kinds of, you know, disastrous uh, things might happen and instantly, and the market would respond in that way. So the role of diplomacy is very important, you know, uh, against those backgrounds. And so, so the, 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 that, that's, that's how I get into this. Uh, so let me go over very quickly uh, uh, by referring to uh, some sections and the sentences from, from the chapter. And uh, this chapter uh, discusses the sort of mental block that refuses to consider any other alternatives than the reliance on deterrence and explore ways to alleviate the undue burden on Okinawa by engaging in diplomacy with a broader outlook. And such diplomacy should be conducted on the premise of maintaining the alliance with the United States, but could free Japan from the security uh, dilemma. Now, uh, 25 years have passed uh, since um, surprising sort of announcement by then Prime Minister Hashimoto and uh, US Ambassador uh, Walter Mondale. Uh, in February 1996. And, uh, and at that time, the SACO was established, Special Action Committee on Kinawa was established and tasked to examine Futenma's replacement options and recommended that the construction uh, of a sea-based facility, which can be removed when no longer necessary. And the, sec and the and SSC, that is two plus two, uh, uh, approved the recommendation in December of that year. I think this this uh, you know, point about uh, replacement facility uh, can be removed. I think this this shows I think uh, sincerity of the policymakers as to the burden of Okinawa, and uh, and despite the fact that the completion of the new base in Hinoko looks more unlikely than ever as stated by previous speakers. Uh, the Japanese government still persists that it is the only solution. And, uh, and, and I think uh, I, I agree that uh, this, this, you know, sticking to this over the last almost 10 years, uh, two plus two statements and so forth have always made a reference to this. I think it's high, high time to reconsider seriously from a strategic point of view and with a long term uh, view. And why this is the case, I think there is a mental block and inertia. And the voice from Okinawa, which experienced the cruel ground battle where civilians were caught in the crossfire in the final days of the Second World War, was an integral part of the foundation of Japan's post war diplomacy. I mean, uh, I'm talking about deep remorse about what we did and take it as a national kind of you know, disaster. But as the voice of conservatives who wished to think that the war was not the result of Japan's mistaken national policies necessarily has grown, then the voice of, voice of Okinawa has gradually been marginalized in Japanese politics and society. And as the China threat perception has risen, the discourse on security in Japan has become somewhat simplistic in loudly proclaiming the importance of deterrence a strategy of exclusively emphasizing the importance of the U.S.-Japan alliance has come to be recited as if it were a theorem. As a consequence, a mental block has set in regarding Okinawa's base burden, 
and the issues regarding the new base uh, at Hikone. And uh, so the role of diplomacy against these sort of, uh, you know, mental block situation, I think is, is very important. And, uh, and the, Japan has been talking about Indo Indo Pacific uh, for some time, but uh, close scrutiny reveals that Japan's vigorous diplomacy in the Indo Pacific region has the traits of, if you will, uh, middle power diplomacy. An example is Japan, North Korea, India, US, so Quad Foreign Ministers meeting uh, held twice so far, and they their statements uh, emphasizes you know practical cooperation in various areas such as quality infrastructure, maritime security, counter terrorism, cyber security, humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, education, human resource development, and and of course, uh, COVID-19 cooperation is, is a new addition to the list. And, uh, and I think another important characteristic of uh, the, the, these statements uh, has to do with their affirmation of the inclusiveness of the Indo-Pacific region and ASEAN centrality as a fundamental principle. And ASEAN has been talking about the inclusive nature of the region for a long time. And, and what they really mean is that they do, not, they do not exclude China in talking about the region. So, so they know, I mean, they have to live, and Japan should know, and we do know, of course, we have to live with China, you know, forever. And uh, many Japanese politicians, experts, and most of the general public, however, understand the FOIP, Free and Open in the Pacific, and the Quad, as part of a Japan-US alliance strategy to deter China. And I think uh, the task to redefine what the really workable Indo-Pacific strategy is, is there between Japan and the United States, I think, to consider further. And the, the, the promise of this diplomacy, I mean, the more adversarial Japan and the US becomes against China, the more likely Australia and India will shy away, not to mention ASEAN, and the Republic of Korea. And uh, promoting Indo-Pacific diplomacy primarily aimed at developing partnerships among middle powers without, of course, reducing the importance of the US would offer um, a new outlook, diplomatic outlook. And given China's gross domestic product and military expenditure having surpassed those of all the Indo-Pacific countries combined, including Japan, India, and the Republic of Korea, Partnerships among these countries would be irrelevant without the U.S. presence as the mainstay of the region. This should lead to the idea of jointly supporting the presence of the United States in the region through partnerships among regional countries, which I call middle powers. So, the conclusion, the simplistic belief in deterrence relying on the U.S.-Japan alliance alone to counter the perceived threat China prevents broader strategic thinking. The result is a hollow promise of reducing the burden on Okinawa. Partnerships among Indo-Pacific middle powers should be so conceptualized as to be instrumental to diffuse tensions between the US and China and to jointly support the US regional presence. And, and that would open a new outlook on the US military base issues on Okinawa as well as the future of the U.S.-Japan alliance. And this is sort of a kind of long-term visionary uh, argument. Uh, but I think uh, in order to deal with the, this tremendous challenge coming from China, we, we do need long-term diplomatic uh, perspectives and thinking. So thank you. I will stop here. Well, thank you very much, Soya Sensei. Um, some very interesting elements there. I hope when we get to the Q and A, we can further uh, discuss um, the interesting statement about Senkaku's as part of a Taiwan contingency, and particularly elaborate a little bit more on the linkages between Okinawa and this uh, vision of the middle power uh, diplomacy uh, plus, as it might be called, with the U.S. as well. But we will come back to that and other issues, I hope, in the Q&A. But now we turn 
to our uh, pr uh, final member of the um, uh, uh, council and speaker, uh, Dr. Akiko Yamamoto, who is at the Department of Law, Politics and International Relations at the University of the Rikus. Uh, welcome, Professor Yamamoto. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me, Satu. And uh, nice to meet you from Okinawa. It's about 11 p.m. and uh, 15 minutes ago, the U.S. military helicopter flight over the apartment where I live. It's an uh, ordinary scene we see by eyes every day in Okinawa. It's a reality of Okinawa. And uh, I wrote chapter six about the status of force agreement and uh, the local agreement. Sorry. Uh, So we see the slide oh. now. Um, please wait a bit. Sorry. Can you see the slide? Yes, we can ah. see the slides. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You may wish to put it in the, there we go, in the slide, um, in the uh, presentation mode. Yes, they are visible now. Thank you, Yamamoto Sensei. Okay, here we go. On the US military has been shifting to distributed and rotational troop deployments because of the the vulnerability of large parliament bases to Chinese missile attacks. As a result, emergency landing of US aircraft on Japanese self-defense forces bases and military airports and low altitude flights over urban areas, coastal regions, and mountain sites where there are no US or Japanese military installation nearby has increased, causing anxiety and resentment in affected local communities. Especially the increase of US training at the SDF facility has provoked anger and strong protest. The US military is disregard of the safety and security of Japanese local community is rooted in the status of force agreement so far. So far, for example, does not have a provision concerning aircraft training. Details such as flight paths, flight hours, and low altitude flights, and other dangerous operations over both land and sea are not regulated. US military aircraft are allowed priority access to civilian airports and seaports in the emergency without fees. When the US military uses the SDF facilities, it is exempt from relevant Japanese law and regulations, ministerial order, and no binding restrictions that apply to Japanese forces. That, that Japanese and the US government has promised to improve the operation of SOFA since 1995 only not to add any reduction of incidents, accidents, and crime of US forces in Japan. The promise of concluding and implementing agreement between the Japanese and the US government regarding the US military bases take place unilaterally without respecting the will of local governments. In July 2018, 
the National Governors Association unanimously adopted a resolution entitled Proposal Concerning the Burden of United States Military Bases. This proposal included a thorough review of SOFAR and the application of the civil aeronautics law and other relevant Japanese law and regulation to US forces in Japan in order to curb incidents, accidents, and crimes. But the Japanese government adhered to its position of improving the operation of so far and has not even considered the proposal of the National Governors Association. Sorry. As so far only protests the status and rights of US forces in Japan, and as long as the Japanese and the US government simply repeat the ineffective policy of improving the operation of SOFAR and resist demands of the governors for a revision of the, of the agreements, the second best option that local governments can take to protect their population is an agreement with the regional defense bureau of the Ministry of Defense. This kind of agreement provides for principle governing the US military training conducted at SDF facility on Japanese territory outside Okinawa and is signed by the host local government and the regional defense bureau in charge of the location concerned. This is probably the only means that local governments have to ensure the safety of their residents. Although, these local level agreements are not binding the, on US forces because the United States does not acknowledge them, they can still give local governments a rationale for conveying their concern to the Japanese government in the context of joint committee meetings and other bilateral occasions. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Yamamoto, uh, for that presentation on SOFA and its local elements. Let me now turn to our discussant, and we are delighted today to have uh, for discussion of the presentations and the report, uh, Mr. Paul H. Vosti, who is Director for Japan Policy uh, and the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy at the US Department of Defense. May I now invite Mr. Vosti, to make some remarks, please. Tatsu, thank you for the opportunity uh, to participate today. Uh, this is a subject I've long been interested in, uh, but I should make it clear that uh, in speaking today, I'm speaking in my personal capacity. Uh, the views that I express do not represent an official US government response or Department of Defense response uh, to the report uh, or to the views of the distinguished panelists. I would like to applaud uh, the publication of this uh, report. Uh, it's a very thoughtful effort, clearly, uh, and appreciate especially the very broad scope it, it took to uh, looking at the Okinawa problem, but in a much uh, broader context and what uh, influences uh, outside of Okinawa have on, on the uh, very particular issues of concern uh, in Okinawa. Um, I would just like to kind of take a step back and kind of uh, just make some general comments to help uh, uh, to uh, further the discussion. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, with the new administration, uh, we are undergoing a number of policy reviews. Uh, there is a, a China policy review, very significant, going on right now, uh, as well as uh, was mentioned in the report, a global posture review. Uh, and we should not uh, try to anticipate uh, ahead of time what the outcome of those reviews would be and, again, how they might or might not impact uh, Okinawa or the uh, U.S.-Japan uh, relationship or the stationing of forces in Japan. Uh, U.S. forces are in Japan, of course, as part of uh, the United States meeting its treaty obligations uh, uh, to Japan, and in particular, Article 5 and Article 6 of the treaty. Uh, uh, pertain to the uh, responsibility that the United States has both in, in uh, contributing to the defense of Japan and also to uh, ensuring uh, regional stability. 
And in the uh, preface of the treaty, uh, it says that both countries share a common concern uh, for the maintenance of peace and security in the region. And I think that is really a very important consideration. And I do appreciate that uh, many of the speakers referenced that in, in, in wrestling with how to address the very real issues that we have in Okinawa, but recognizing uh, uh, kind of the larger uh, responsibility that uh, both nations face uh, in, in, uh, in the region. Um, I, I have been very much involved in it, and so we'll speak a little bit about uh, the, uh, the realignment plan uh, for the U.S. forces in Japan. And uh, there wasn't, uh, I think, uh, uh, perhaps uh, Professor Nozoe uh, spoke directly about uh, the realignment plan. And uh, I'll just say that, you know, the effort of the 2006 realignment plan, and we uh, did an update of it in 2012, uh, the purpose was uh, to uh, reduce uh, the number of U.S. forces uh, uh, in, in Okinawa. One of the, one of the purposes of the, of the plan was to reduce the number of forces uh, in Okinawa and also return a significant amount of land uh, in that area south of Kadena and uh, in terms of the main island of Okinawa, uh, the population is in central and south Okinawa, the main uh, part of the population. And, and so the bases there, I think, are a, a particular source of, uh, of kind of uh, daily friction or daily uh, discomfort. And so uh, the, one of the efforts of the plan uh, uh, is to address that issue, uh, ultimately to ensure the stable basing of, of U.S. forces uh, throughout Japan, in Okinawa and throughout Japan. Of course, the original plan also had a very uh, large number of other initiatives, uh, many of which have been completed. And so it's uh, somewhat uh, uh, disappointing, but understandable that the most intractable, intractable problems uh, uh, are the ones that are the hardest uh, to resolve. So even though we have brought uh, Japanese military forces onto uh, many of our bases in mainland Japan, uh, we have introduced uh, additional uh, military capabilities uh, in, in other locations in Japan. Uh, the effort to uh, uh, realign our forces in Okinawa is taking time, uh, taking more time than anybody uh, uh, wants or, or perhaps originally uh, expected. And this is disappointing, uh, but it's not unusual, I think, in, in something as complex as this. Uh, it's not unexpected. And, and uh, we will just note that progress continues, even uh, at uh, the Futema replacement facility. Uh, progress, uh, though slow, does continue. Uh, as several uh, of the speakers mentioned, uh, the US and Japanese governments have uh, in their various two plus two statements and even in the summit level joint statements uh, reaffirmed uh, the, uh, the plan to uh, relocate the functions, most of the functions from uh, Marine Corps Air Station Futema up to uh, the replacement facility in Hinoko uh, on Camp Schwab and, and in landfill surrounding uh, Camp Schwab, a significant change to the operation at Camp Schwab um, and uh, this is important uh, because of the way the Marines operate. And so uh, we have always emphasized our forces that are forward, uh, whether they be in Korea, Japan, in Europe, uh, the forces that are forward have to be trained and ready. It's not just a matter of putting them there and having them sit there. In fact, going way back before many of you uh, 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 we're probably around, uh, uh, but there is a lesson that was learned at the start of the Korean War where our U.S. forces uh, that were doing occupation duty in post-war Japan were the first forces sent to respond to the uh, uh, attack in Korea. And what we found was they were no longer prepared to conduct combat operations. They suffered terrible losses. And as a result, the forces that were trying to protect uh, the Republic of Korea government were brought all the way down to just the, the bottom tip of the peninsula. Ever since that, uh, the U.S. military has had as its number one uh, operating concept that you have to have trained and ready forces. It's not just a matter of where you are, but 
the capabilities you have there. So we we train vigorously, and the reality is, uh, as people uh, in Okinawa certainly understand that training uh, creates friction, and training uh, creates this, uh, you know, uh, difficulty uh, with local populations, and it's not unique to Okinawa. Uh, it's a matter of uh, of uh, issue around any military base with active forces that train. Uh, the somewhat unusual situation is, of course, Okinawa is a very hot, heavily populated area, and so these forces are operating and training in areas with uh, significant populations around them, and so we recognize that. The Status of Forces Agreement exists to try to manage uh, that balance between operations and training and the concerns of the local population, and we're well aware that uh, it is not uh, always operating in a way that's uh, satisfactory to the local population, but it is constantly, it is, the, it is the mechanism in which we manage that, in which we make adjustments, uh, and the adjustments have to be implemented. If, if adjustments that are made to SOFA procedures are not implemented, that is a valid issue for, uh, uh, for further discussion and, and uh, adjustment. So, we always uh, are looking at the SOFA and how it can be made better and, and what, uh, what conditions can, uh, can be uh, adjusted. And I, and I would, uh, the comment about uh, the, the uh, arrangements made with local bureaus, I think is important. We recognize that often, often the uh, agreements have been made between the, by the local bureaus and uh, the, uh, and the bases at which US forces may operate. Uh, come as somewhat of a surprise to US forces. And so uh, we should have a better mechanism for understanding what those arrangements are and, and having a chance uh, at the outset of, of making those arrangements to have a voice in, in, in giving our considerations. But uh, it, uh, it, uh, it, is, it is very difficult uh, uh, to conduct training. And we do, uh, you know, since uh, 96, we have had training relocation. A lot of the training that formerly had been taking place in Okinawa, now is relocated to other uh, bases, uh, training areas in Japan. Those training areas uh, in mainland Japan are primarily self-defense force facilities. In fact, I think uh, they are exclusively self-defense force facilities for training. So uh, I'm not a uh, stickler uh, for statistics, but um, and I know that there are certain statistics about U.S. bases that are uh, uh, presented as hard and uh, irrefutable facts. Uh, but we, you know, statistics are, are just that statistics. And all of our operations in training areas in mainland Japan are not taking place on U.S. bases, even though we routinely train in those uh, locations. So the large training areas that we have in Okinawa are part of this uh, exclusive uh, U.S. Uh, facility. Now, we are certainly looking for opportunities to allow uh, Japanese forces to train with us or train on those bases. That would change the, uh, that could change the SOFA status of those bases, uh, which would fundamentally change the, the statistics that are often uh, quoted. So I, I would only encourage people to really understand uh, that statistical uh, argument about the U.S. bases, there is no doubt. I think we acknowledge that roughly 50% of U.S. forces are in, in Okinawa in terms of numbers. Uh, and that is something, again, with the realignment plan, uh, uh, as many as 9,000 Marines would be leaving Okinawa. Uh, significant bases in the south, uh, Kinzer, which is known as Makiminato, uh, Futenma, if the FRF is completed, uh, large parts of uh, um, uh, Camp Lester, uh, which is known as Camp Kauai in, in uh, Okinawa, uh, and parts of Camp Foster, uh, uh, Zukaran. Parts of those would all be returned in, in the south, uh, and, and large number of forces would, would be reduced. But the implementation of that uh, plan uh, is slow, but it, it does. I think go a long way towards addressing uh, the desires of the Okinawan people while, again, maintaining our, our, our uh, commitments to security. But I think, again, to go back to my point and just to conclude, I think uh, I do appreciate the broad scope 
of this report because really the challenge of China and how to address to address, address China really uh, affects what happens in Okinawa. Um, many of the uh, focus on some of the new operating concepts and stuff, uh, I would just again point out that a lot of those are operational concepts. So they are not advocating for uh, having widely dispersed in small units in a peacetime uh, or phase zero environment, that is uh, movement in terms of operation. And so this balance between looking for more places to have forces from which to uh, disperse, uh, at, but at the same time uh, having uh, uh, sufficient forces in place to train and operate at, at the level that needs to be done is again a challenge that has to be worked. Uh, we are working to uh, improve the capability and uh, importance of Guam, U.S. territory that's in the Indo-Pacific and will relieve some of the pressure off of Okinawa while still keeping forces uh, nearby. Uh, but uh, again, in order for us to meet our commitments to the defense of Japan and to also uh, have a role in regional stability, uh, we do believe, and again, this is a discussion between the U.S. government and the Japanese government, that there is a place certainly for U.S. forces in Japan, and that includes uh, U.S forces uh, in Okinawa. And so the, uh, the most important thing is to manage that uh, in a way that uh, uh, does not unduly uh, uh, impact or unfairly impact the people there. So I, again, I, I really appreciate the report. I, I learned things out of this and I uh, appreciate it. I think some of the issues that are raised deserve further study and clarification and discussion. And I certainly uh, would uh, welcome that. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Vosti, for joining and for those comments. Um, you know, they're, they're very useful to have as we discuss uh, the issues that have been brought up in the report and by the presenters. And I do want to give some time to our attendees and participants. And I confess to you that this is a little difficult. We have approximately 12 minutes left uh, for the Q&A session and a quite a robust list. So you're going to please have to excuse me if I do not get through everyone. I'm going to try and combine around some themes. So let me start with one which, um, which I think takes on both the technical elements, but also an issue that keeps coming up uh, in both Paul's comments, but also others. And it sort of has to do with the strategic and operational elements of the issue. And this is from Jeff Hornung. He has a specific technical question about the example of Kansai Airport, which also ran into difficulties regarding a soft seabed. Um, and they uh, were able to address that. So because sort of you know, what can be learned um, in the context of engineering about addressing this in the, um, in the case of Okinawa um, and, and, and Henneko. The broader strategic one is seems to be a thread line running through our discussion today. Um, as Paul ended by saying sort of, there's kind of a concurrence that there's this big issue of US China, but lots of different presentations on what the meaning of that uh, situation is. Uh, Mike Mochizuki's presentation, Soya Sensei's, uh, Paul's. So Jeff asks, there's a lot of talk about the cost of Futen Mahenako and benefits of dispersing forces. And there are operational benefits, but there are also costs. Um, and I wondered, since this links with Paul's questions, if you could talk about the implications of degraded communications, vulnerable integration locations, et cetera, how did you consider that in your report? So why don't we start with that one? Um, I know Nozoe Sensei spoke about operational concepts. Um, I know that. Um, uh, Mike uh, and Soya Sensei may have something to say about this as well, per per perhaps Professor Yamamoto as well. So why don't we start, uh, Nozoe Sensei, do you want to comment on the strategic operational question that Jeff has raised? And then someone else, perhaps Yanag Yanagi Sawasan can address the soft uh, Kansai airport issue. Thank you for uh, the question. Uh, in this report, uh, we propose that the uh, that the U.S. and uh, U.S. 
forces in Okinawa should be dispersed uh, from Okinawa to other uh, main islands of Japan and uh, across the Asia Pacific region. And uh, uh, in case, uh, in, in the, uh, with, with regard with, uh, in case of the main islands of Japan, uh, the US military forces in Okinawa should be uh, relocated from uh, Okinawa to the self defense, uh, the basis of self defense forces in uh, Japan's uh, main islands. Uh, in this case, the, the bases should be uh, co shared with US forces as the, the US forces. Uh, by doing this, uh, uh, US Japan Alliance uh, can uh, deepen the interoperability okay. and uh, the reduce the military vulnerability. That's, uh, uh, that's our uh, answer. Thank you, Nisoy san. Anyone else on the panel um, on the council want to make a remark on that issue? Yes, uh, Soya Sensei, I saw your hand, please, sir. Sorry, no, I didn't. I did. Oh, I saw your uh, the yellow uh, hand on the participant. Okay, uh, yeah, anyone sorry. else? Um, then yes, who? Yanagi yeah, yeah, Sasan. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. Yanagi, oh, there. I see your hand. Yes, Yanagi Sawasan, please. You're on mute, sir. Yanagi Sawasan, you are on mute. Okay, I'm sorry. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. You can hear me. 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 朝鮮戦争の時代、あるいはベトナム戦争の時代と今日はあの全く違うのは何かっていうと、それはね、ミサイルバランスが問題になっているということなんですね。で、あの朝鮮戦争の時代もベトナム戦争の時代も、中国や北朝鮮から沖縄が攻撃される心配はなかったんですね。ところが、今はまさにその中国のミサイルの射程の中にあって、その面では圧倒的に中国が優位になっているというところが問題。したがって、えー、もしこれをその抑止しようとすれば、中国の意思よりもアメリカの意思の方が、えー、よほど強,強くなければね、えー、抑止できないということになる。しかし、中国の意思は、えー、決して弱いものではないので、アメリカの意思が強くなければ、抑止はできないしかしアメリカの意思が強すぎれば、えー、かえって、えー、実際の、えー、戦争の危険も高まるというこういう非常に、えー、厄介な複雑な今状況に我々は置かれているということなんですね。したがってその単に抑止の観点から、えー、沖縄の基地を維持するということではなくてもっと柔軟な特にあの外交的なその米アメリカと中国の、えー、コミュニケーションをもっとしっかりやってもらわないと我々は非常にあの、えー、リスキーな状況に置かれているでその中で、えー、沖縄の基地も、えー、沖縄の基地をどう扱うかということによって、ね、むしろ米中関係の安定が図られるようなその基地の再編の仕方もあるんだろうと私は思っています。それからもう一つあの技術的なお話ですけれども、確かに関西空港でもあるいは羽田空港でもね、マヨネーズと言われるようなあの非常に深い軟弱地盤が存在したんですね。そこでの工事工事の実績は上げています。ただこれらはあの毎年あの相当沈んでいます地盤が沈んでいますから、えー、相当な手入れが必要なんですね。辺野古でも当然そういうことが起こると思うんですが、問題はその深さが全く違うんですね。えー、関西空港でも羽田沖でも、えー、せいぜい4 5 0メートルだったと思いますが、えー、辺野古の場合は一番深いところで9 0メートル、そして、えー、そこまで、えー、砂,食い砂のパイルを打ち込める。技術,技術は今存在しないということを
、えー、私たちは問題にしていますそこをしっかり検証をすべきだということを申し上げておりますありがとうございましたヤナギヤナギイサワさん Thank you so much for addressing both of those questions I want to give a chance to Paul if he has any follow up On the comments by our participants from the Council on the strategic aspects and the US China element at this time. Paul? Sorry, I didn't hear the first part of your comment. I was switching channel.、Uh, no worries. I, I was asking whether you wanted to come in at this point as the discussant on either Nozoe san's or Yanagi Sawa san's. Comments regarding the strategic elements that Jeff Hornung raised.、Um, otherwise, we can、uh, move to the next question and you can come in later. Well, I, I do think I, I didn't, I, I, I certainly did not mean to suggest that uh, uh, the Korean War and how it unfolded uh, uh, is a model for what we would envision. I think people are wrestling with uh, uh, what conflict would look like.、Uh, Between powers using the most modern and capable uh, uh, weapons. And so it's, it's almost uh, uh, unmanageable, but there, we believe there are certain fundamental、uh, realities, which is you have to have trained and ready forces. These, these forces have to understand、uh, the reality of, of、uh, missiles and, and the reality of, of、uh, cyber attacks and space based attacks. And all of these things are new. And, and are subject of a lot of、uh, deep thinking and, and, and uh, uh, disagreement and, 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 and discussion. So、uh, I certainly don't、uh, mean to simplify the, the challenge in, in Okinawa、uh, and in Japan. But, but nevertheless,、uh, the aggressive actions of China and, and how they might.、Uh, Try to、uh, change the status quo in the Taiwan Strait, for example. And certainly, I would agree with the suggestion that、uh, a Senkaku's contingency could certainly be the result of a heightened tension、uh, in the Taiwan Strait. These are things that we have to、uh, wrestle with and figure out. Now, the, I'm not,、uh, in terms of the other、uh, point about just the technical challenges of the construction. Of the replacement facility. I certainly, uh, uh, we have been briefed extensively on that, and it is certainly、uh, does face challenges. But、uh, you know, we understand that、uh, they are technical challenges, and there are, and there are technical solutions to those. And so, until that is shown to be、uh, the case, I think we believe there is a need、uh, for that uh, facility uh, at, at the、uh, Hinoko. Well, thank you very much indeed, Paul. Let me,、uh, we are again at the end of our time, but I really do want to take another question because this asks a direct question to our participants on the council in particular.、Um, and this is from Hiroshi Meguro.、Uh, Meguro san asks about a possible compromise because you've talked about, you know, of emphasized in the report and in your statements, the only solution, that kind of phrasing. Um, but here's a question from Meguro san about options. Did you discuss some of these? One is、um, about the Okinawa prefecture accepting the southern part of the Futenma replacement facility project that has already gone forward, has already progressed, while stopping the plan in the northern area on the Ora Bay side with the soft seabed, which you know, we've discussed.、Uh, on this side, perhaps an option could be to construct a wharf or pier type facility. Within Camp Schwab. In other words, a southern Hanako facility plus、uh, an alternative. I, I wondered if the, the council、uh, considered such uh, different uh, plans rather than an either or element. And I'd be particularly interested in whether these options,、uh, I'm adding to Megrosan's question, whether. How much of this you've discussed with the government of Japan itself? This,、uh, this did not come up so much in your presentations. What has been the nature of your dialogue with Tokyo from the prefectural point of view about such issues? Please, 
I don't know who'd like to lead off. Yanagi, uh, Yanagi Sawa-san, I see as the chair, your hand is... Yes, sorry. There are other people who are there, but... It's already made up of things that we can do when we think about it. It's actually, when we're planning to build a 1800-meter-long path, it's not just 31... え、31ミュの今普天間にいるえ、ヘリコプター部隊のためのヘリポートを作るのであれば、え、今の面積で十分だと思うんですね。新たな埋め立てはいらないはずなんですね。ただこのことだから、それを踏まえた上で普天間は
may not be sustainable. Uh, in other words, I doubt if there is some really strategic value uh, to this from a you know particular American uh, you know strategic or military point of view. And if that's the case, and if if I'm wrong, of course, uh, it's it's fine. But uh, I myself have become convinced about that personally. And if that's the case, I think it's high time for uh, particularly the Japanese government to begin to think alternatives. Mm -hmm. And so the, I think this is the important message of, of the report. I mean, the Japanese government should be more, become more flexible. Mm -hmm. And rather than sticking to this Henoko being the only solution, and asking the Washington, Washington to agree to this and write this into statements, you know, and uh, so so that's, I think that's the important message that we'd like to, you know, bring to, to the public and hopefully to, to the government. And mm -hmm. the other thing we are proposing is there should be some sort of trilateral forum, US, US government, Japanese government, and Okinawa, you know, prefecture uh, to, to, to discuss this. And maybe if formal setup cannot be achieved immediately, then maybe track to sort of attempt, you know, to, to discuss these things, you know, among the th three parties. I think uh, we are also proposing this, but of course it takes, you know, time, energy, money, and so forth. So it's not easy, but I think that's, that, that, that's up to where we are discussing. And uh, what's the alternative? I think that is going to come out of this, you know, process, uh, you know, after, you know, sort of changing the current uh, government posture and get into real substantial strategic, political, financial, and all other discussions. Yeah. Uh, Soya Sensei, if I may just follow up this issue of, uh, before asking Paul, uh, giving him an opportunity if he wishes, uh, this issue of whether Hanoko will ever be built has, you know, has gone on for some time. This is not a new element. I'm, I'm curious, in your case, you said that you've come to the conclusion on the basis of your work on the council for the past two years, is there a particular finding or assessment or variable that it has led you to this conclusion that it will never get built? Um, I, I just wondered, and given that your emphasis on the regional diplomacy element, I am curious of a trilateral approach because you seem to embed, you know, your your chapter or your section of the report in a in a wider context of of. Of diplomacy amongst regional countries, that seems like a pretty high bar to set. And one, and more yeah, importantly, uh, that the trilateral can't sort that out. Yeah, different different levels, uh, you know, so, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe this trilateral forum is more immediate. And uh, the, what I discussed in terms of Indo-Pacific nations collaboration, you know, to to do with China challenge. And of course, American presence. I think this this is about regional cooperation. I see. East Asia has been lacking, you know, so badly in the past years, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, European analogy may not be relevant in all dimensions, but only as a general form, you know, what Europe did, we we haven't done, you know, among 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 regional countries. And I think it's high time for us to begin to do this mm -hmm. and create sort of regional infrastructure, so to speak, out of collaboration among ourselves. Mm -hmm. And on the basis of which we talk to the Americans and we deal with Chinese. And so, so that's kind of my kind of long term sort of uh, framework reference, uh, if mm -hmm. you will. And, uh, but, but when it's come to the immediate, immediate things, uh, I mean, the, in this trilateral setup, of course, uh, re regional representatives could be, could be invited. Mm -hmm. I think because I think primarily, you know, this has been dealt with as an Okinawa issue for some time, but now people are talking about is, is an issue for the entire Japan, but I'm, I'm going a step further. This is a regional issue, mm -hmm. you know, rather than Okinawa or Japan only. And mm -hmm. I think the Okinawa question should be addressed from a regional perspective. That's, that's the message of my, my chapter. And uh, so, so there are different levels. Yeah, of, of sort of 
uh, reference. Yeah, so, so. Thank you. And, and the factor that led you to really doubt whether henna could... Oh, yeah, that's a most critical uh, thing experience was when we had hearing from a civil engi engineering expert mm. and who has been studying this very in detail. Mm. And uh, so one comment uh, which still lingers in my mind is if I were an advisor, I would never, I would never suggest Henoko. If mm. if he if he had known this beforehand, of course, you know, Washington Tokyo didn't know about this, you know, soft soft sea base, and but uh, so purely from a, a technical point of view, and uh, th this would be the, the worst uh, choice from a civil engineering point of view, and of course that's one thing. The other, some some different level fact. Uh, was, you know, original agreement was 1996, mm. and at least it it would take 12 more years, or maybe maybe more. Mm. Then it will be almost you know 40, 50 years after the original agreement, mm. and security environments have changed a lot. But sticking to this original structure, something wrong about it, you know, from from sort of you know strategic perspective. And uh, so, so you, you should, so I think this is an issue for American military. I mm. mean, to what extent Henoko base would be useful, you know, for it, of course, there is utility, of course, but from a, from a bigger sort of strategic point of view. And, uh, and so I think, uh, okay, I'll, I'll stop here uh, because oh. the other things would be a uh, bit sad. Uh, so yes, I'd say thank you so much. Uh, as always, very interesting to to hear your perspectives. Uh, Paul, do you have any final comments? Because we are over, but I really the discussion was going. I really wanted to capture some of the things in the Q and A. So do want to give you a chance as well if you wish to make. Yeah, that. I mean there there is a lot of uh, uh, very interesting points, of course, all over the place now. So I, I, I again, I'm not a technical expert on the construction uh, of the landfill base. Uh, it was pointed out to me, though, in one, in one briefing I attended, that the uh, expansion of uh, Haneda Airport up in Tokyo involved over a million of these pillars being driven into the into the uh, into the uh, seabed to uh, fortify the land, and and certainly Kansai also. Uh, there certainly presents challenges. Uh, Professor Yanagisawa's point about uh, the depth is an interesting point that I had not heard before. Uh, I certainly uh, am interested in finding out more about that. I also agree with uh, the point that uh, this is not strictly a military issue. This is about diplomacy uh, to resolve the issue. And, and I think uh, the, the administration is committed to engaging uh, in the region, engaging with China uh, across all fronts, whether it's strictly diplomatic, economic, uh, transportation, any of the issues. COVID uh, kind of is, a, is an example of how uh, cooperation has to happen and the challenges of cooperation. And so I think uh, that, will, uh, that will be fundamental as well. Uh, with respect to the question of changing uh, the plan, I, I'm personally aware of, let's see, one, two, three, four, I think five different iterations of a plan uh, uh, the plan uh, is designed to meet uh, stated requirements to the minimal level. Actually, not all of the capabilities that we have at MCAS Futema would be re uh, replicated at the FRF. And so, uh, you know, these are questions uh, between the governments that would have to uh, uh, be resolved. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. We are over time, but it is just a, a sort of a sign of how uh, rich and important this discussion is, though ongoing for decades, but really an important one. And uh, we're very grateful uh, to the uh, council uh, appointed by uh, the Honorable Governor of Okinawa uh, for the report and for offering to present this report on this webinar. And of course, to Paul Vosti for willing to uh, be a discussant for the report. So I want to sincerely thank you and to a special thanks to Mike Mochizuki for flagging this opportunity to engage both uh, an American, a Japanese, an Okinawan, and of course, regional audience because the East-West Center reaches widely into the region. 
Um, I want to thank the interpreters for their very active efforts in making sure everyone had access to be able to hear these uh, great thoughts and experience and expertise. And uh, uh, we will uh, post the recording of the video and the PowerPoint presentations on our site and we will social media out and send emails so that you may access it if you wish to refer. I'm so sorry we were not able to take questions, but I hope Mike and Sonia Sensei and others and I can confer on how we might follow up, uh, intrigued by some ways of further uh, in engaging this discussion, uh, including with our regional partners and, and, and friends. And that might be something that um, the East West Center could be helpful with. Um, and again, thank you to the chair, Yanagi Sawasan, uh, for your presence here as well. Uh, Sarah, thanks for all your technical expertise. With that, I will uh, sign off, bid you all uh, a, a good evening and some rest for those of you in Japan. Uh, it's very late at night. And please do stay tuned for upcoming programs. We have a very interesting series on North Korea's relations with external countries as part of our North Korea and the World website. Mm -hmm. First one kicks off on North Korea's relations with the post-colonial world and how a new book on uh, uh, North Korea's diplomacy with the global South and why that persists, uh, as well as an Asian Development Bank 21, 2021 economic outlook uh, program coming up. So those are all in the chat, so stay tuned. With that, again, good night to friends in Japan and in the region, and good day to everyone here on the US side Thank you so much. Be well, be safe, and see you again soon. Bye-bye.